Hi, welcome to New Hope Community Church Online. The sermon you are about to hear was originally given by Pastor Chuck Wilson. New Hope Community Church, to know, to live, and to share Jesus Christ. The title for today is Out of Our Comfort Zone. Out of Our Comfort Zone. That We're all going to be there after today. <laughs> Joshua 5, 11 and 12. Uh, But first of all, today is a special holiday. Anybody know what today is? Purim. It's Purim, right? And uh, we have uh, many people from Jewish heritage backgrounds here. And those who are from that know you've probably already been celebrating it, thinking about it already today. It's the day that the Jewish people remember how God delivered them in the book of Esther. Purim. All right? And in God's word... And throughout history, we see how God has miraculously preserved the Jewish people in the face of incredible persecutions. It's just amazing that God has protected his people throughout history. Purim is one amazing example. It comes from the book of Esther when Queen Esther, Miss Persia, helped deliver the the Jewish people, Esther 4.14. If, for if you remain silent at this time, relief and deliverance for the Jews will arise from another place, but you and your father's family will perish, and who knows but that you have come to royal position for such a time as this. Every one of us, for such a time as this, God has a purpose for us. And her purpose was to help deliver the Jews All throughout the scripture, we see God protecting his people, preserving his people, keeping a remnant. And even as we get to the end times, we know there's going to be a Jewish remnant that's going to be there for for the Christ's second coming. But all throughout history, a lot of you might not know other instances of miraculous deliverance involving Purim. In the early 1950s, uh, Joseph Stalin was planning to deal with the Jewish problem. And uh, Joseph Stalin was probably the worst mass murder in history. Um, how we ever kept him as an ally, I don't, can't imagine. But he, a horrible, horrible guy. And he planned to kill the Jews in Russia, but before he could carry out his plans, he died in 1953 on Purim. On Purim. 1991, Saddam Hussein invaded Kuwait, and he tried to pull the rest of the Muslim countries into this master plan of his. So he started shooting the Scuds. Remember the Scud missiles? He started shooting them into Israel. And they showed great restraint, not responding, which would probably trigger World War III. But the U.S. led a coalition of forces to attack Iraq, and they won the final victory, and the hostilities ceased on the day of Purim. Purim. So a lot of interesting history, not just in the Bible, but in history of of God's miraculous delivery. And we have been studying the book of Joshua, and we are seeing God's miraculous protection of the Jewish people in the book of Joshua. It started with Egypt. When he delivered them, they were slaves in Egypt. It started with Egypt. We talked about the Passover last week, and and we know what led to the Passover. They were slaves, and God sent Moses, let my people go. Pharaoh said no. Ten plagues later, uh, they let them go. God parted the Red Sea. He preserved them in the wilderness, even when they were unfaithful. And now they're ready to take the promised land here in the book of Joshua. And once again, we see God's protection. He parts the Jordan River and lets them walk through on on the dry land there. He protects them as they circumcise all the males there. They protected them, completely helpless, protected them. And then they also celebrated the Passover. Once again, miraculous protection. The enemy didn't come out and attack them either time. And now we're going to see today that God takes them to a whole new level of faith and spiritual growth and maturity in the next couple verses. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for the worship. We thank you for the ministry you've put in front of us with St. Baldrick's this week. And we thank you for your word. And there's just a couple verses here, but boy, do they have a lesson for us today. What you're trying to do in our life and what you are doing in our life. Father, we pray for your mercy and grace that each one of us, just as you move the Israelites forward in their faith, that you would move us forward in our faith today. 
We pray that in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, Joshua 5. I want to read, start with verse 10, which we covered last week, but then the next couple of verses too. In Joshua 5, starting with verse 10, on the evening of the 14th day of the month, while camped at Gilgal on the plains of Jericho, the Israelites celebrated the Passover. The day after the Passover, that very day, they ate some of the produce of the land, unleavened bread and roasted grain. The manna stopped the day after they ate this food from the land. There was no longer any manna for the Israelites, but that year they ate of the produce of the land. Now we saw last week, verse 10, that celebrated Passover. If you weren't here, get that uh, CD or listen on the podcast or YouTube. Uh, wow, a lot, a lot packed into that verse. But then in verse 11, we see they ate the unleavened bread. Leaven is a picture of sin, right? It's a picture of sin. But now that they've eaten the Passover lamb, which is Jesus being sacrificed, we talked about all this last week, they put their, we put our faith in Jesus. It's very important that we get rid of the sin in our life. Holiness, very, very important when we talk about holiness. Uh, but another key detail we see here in verse 11 is they, ate the pro, they used the produce of the land for the bread, which they made unleavened bread out of. They used the produce of the land, and they did that because in verse 12 it says the manna, Stopped. The manna stopped. Why did the manna stop? Why? And I just couldn't get past this question. I wasn't planning on even preaching these verses originally, but I just couldn't get past it. I just dug in the last few weeks on this. Why did the manna stop? Now, there's a natural reason why. He tells us there why he stopped. Why? Because there's food, right? They could eat the produce of the land now, just like God had promised them. In fact, in Deuteronomy 6... In Deuteronomy 6, he's telling them, get ready to go and take the land. And in Deuteronomy 6, verse 10, listen to what he says. When the Lord your God brings you into the land, he swore to your fathers, to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, to give you a land with large, flourishing cities you did not build, houses filled with all kinds of good things you did not provide, wells you did not dig, and vineyards and olive groves you did not plant, then when you eat and are satisfied... Be careful that you do not forget the Lord who brought you out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. So he's telling them, he's, gonna, he's promising to take them in and give them this land and all the food and everything there. He's going to do that. But isn't that stealing? Isn't that stealing? No. no. Why? Because God gave it to them. They, these people, the Canaanites, were under God's judgment. And when God has had enough of what a country's you know, sin is going on. When he's had enough, he judges. In fact, in Genesis 15, verse 12, Genesis 15, verse 12, it says this. As the sun was setting, Abram fell into a deep sleep, and a thick and dreadful darkness came over him. Then the Lord said to him, Know for certain that your descendants will be strangers in a country not their own, and they will be enslaved and mistreated 400 years. What is he talking about? Egypt. Okay, but I will punish the nation they serve as slaves, and after they will come out with great possessions. You, however, will go to your fathers in peace and be buried at a good old age. In the fourth generation, your descendants will come back here, for the sin of the Amorites has not yet reached its full measure. He's saying, Abram, I'm going to bring you back to the, this area where the Amorites, Canaanites, Hittites, Hivites, you know, we went through the termites last time, right? You're going to come back here, and, and I'm going to give you this land. Why? Were they stealing it? No. God was taking it away because the sin had reached its full measure. And that's what happens when, when a country has turned its back so far on God that at some point, he says, that's enough. The cup is full. The full measure is full, and now comes the judgment. It happens to every country. You study history. Every country throughout history faces this. Countries are either being established by God or they're, they're declining and heading toward judgment. And the USA Today, we are praying for a revival. We're praying for a spiritual awakening so that we don't hit the, the full cup. But we are definitely facing a decision time as a country. In fact, in Jeremiah 18, in Jeremiah 18 it says, 
Listen to what God says in Jeremiah 18, verse 7. If at any time I announce that a nation or kingdom is to be uprooted, torn down, and destroyed, and if that nation I warn repents of its evil, then I will relent and not inflict on it the disaster I had planned. And if at another time I announce that a nation or kingdom is to be built up and planted, and if it does evil in my sight and does not obey me, then I will reconsider the good I intended to do for it. That's a warning for us, but it's showing that why God judged the, 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 the Canaanites here. Wait till we get further along and we see how God actually has them exterminated. There's a reason, a shocking reason. When you, we find out what they were involved in, you know why God had to judge them and destroy them. But they didn't steal this. God gave this land, and even now, God has given this land to the Israel. Israel, the promised land, it's theirs. And we don't care what the UN says, and we don't care what anybody says, because God has given that land to the Jewish people as their very own. Remember that in all these, all these political discussions. So, when Israel, the Israelites cross the Jordan, they have this miraculous crossing, and the Canaanites freaked out. We saw, we saw what already happened with Rahab. They were freaked out. They fled to the walled cities. They already knew about the Red Sea parting 40 years ago. They see the Jordan River part. Uh-oh, we're in trouble, right? So they pull into the cities, and when they did that, they abandoned their houses, their farms, their fields, their vineyards, and all their food. They abandoned it, and there was lots of it. And now the Israelites could live off of this food for the next year until they could plant their crops and grow their own food, right? And that is why, according to Joshua, back to Joshua, that's why the miraculous manna stopped. That's the natural reason. God doesn't waste his miracles, right? God doesn't waste miracles. And it was time for the people to work for their food now. Now it's time for them to work. There's no more free lunch. <laughs> There's no more free lunch. That's the natural reason why the manna stopped. But remember now, the manna is a picture. It's a type. The whole book of Joshua is a, a picture, a type. Joshua is a picture of Jesus, same exact word. Taking the promised land is a picture of our spiritual battles today as we try to claim and live out the promises that God has given us. The promised land is a picture of the spiritual land that God has promised us. We are granted spiritual promises that we have to fight for. We have to battle for them. It's a battle. It's a picture. There's a physical land. There's a, ours is a spiritual land. And that's a picture of that. And so, so we, we see the manna stopping back to Joshua 5 verse 12. I'm going to read it to you again. In Joshua 5 12 it says, the manna stopped the day after they ate this food from the land. There was no longer any manna for the Israelites, but that year they ate of the produce of Canaan. Manna stopping is a picture, too. It has, there's a sup, an important supernatural reason, too. Not just a natural reason because there's food, but there's a supernatural reason. It fulfilled a prophetic type. The Passover was just celebrated. The lamb was just sacrificed, which represented Jesus dying on the cross, right? And the manna stops right after that. Right after the next verse. It stops because Jesus fulfilled the type of the manna. Jesus fulfilled it. He fulfilled the purpose of the manna. In John chapter 6, it says this. In John chapter 6, verse, I'll read a couple verses here. I'll start with verse 32. Jesus said to them, I tell you the truth, it is not Moses who has given you the bread from heaven, but it is my Father who gives you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is he who comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. Sir, they said, from now on, give us this bread. Then Jesus declared, I am the bread of life. He who comes to me will never go hungry, and he who believes in me will never be thirsty. Jesus fulfilled, on, not just the Passover lamb, but he fulfilled the manna. The purpose was fulfilled. Jesus, our Joshua, came down from heaven. Came down from heaven. He's the manna, the heavenly manna. He went into the river of 
judgment, Jordan, judgment. He went into the river of judgment for us. Not only that, but the ark went in, which represented the work of Jesus Christ. Remember the mercy seat, the whole thing, represented his death on the cross and what he did for us. That's what happened. He made a way through the judgment for us. Not only did he go in, but he made a way through all the Israelites. His chosen people went through that river too, right? And they followed him by how? A step of faith. Remember the step of faith we talked about? And then he takes them into the promised land, which represents our new life in Christ and someday going to heaven. But the promised land, is heaven. The, the promised land primarily is our life in Christ that starts here and now. And it ultimately ends up in heaven someday. And after his death, and after his resurrection, after Jesus' death and resurrection, which was pictured by the river, remember going into the river, coming up out of the river, that's a picture of the resurrection. We talked about all this a lot. And the Passover, once again, representing Jesus dying for us. As soon as that happens, the manna's gone. The manna disappears. At that very moment, it's gone. Why? Because Jesus fulfilled the purpose of the manna. He fulfilled it. But also, here's something I was really wrestling with. Where is the manna? The manna disappeared, but where, where did it go? It's still in heaven. It's the bread from heaven. It's still in heaven, right? It's the heavenly bread. It disappeared. Where did Jesus go after the ultimate Passover? Where did he go? 40 days after the resurrection, he disappeared. He ascended up into heaven in the view of the apostles. The angels were there. He ascended back up into heaven. And now he's at the right hand of God interceding for us and he's coming back again soon. Right? That's, he's fulfilled. That's a, the, the manna is a picture. Jesus, after the Passover, went back up again. Just like the manna disappeared. It, he, he fulfilled the whole picture there. Supernatural picture that's why the manna stopped natural and supernatural reason but there's one more very important connection we have to make here there's another vital reason why the manna stopped and I want to connect some dots to our lives now this is where it gets uncomfortable for 40 years <laughs> for 40 years there was manna right almost 40 years six days a week manna here we go it's great it was always there and then all of a sudden it stops they cross the river and it stops. That had to be a little scary. That had to be uncomfortable, right? Where's the manna? But God had a plan. He wanted to move them forward. He wanted to move them from the wilderness to the promised land. He wanted to take them from life in the desert where they were to an abundant life, a land flowing with milk and honey. He wanted to move them forward. And God does the same with us, doesn't he? He wants to move us to a higher level of spiritual maturity. That's his goal for our life. He wants to move us forward in our spiritual life so that we will claim our promises. The promises that he's given us in his word. He wants us to claim them and to live them out. The holiness, the, the peace, the joy, the spiritual victory, the purpose. Fulfilling our spiritual potential. He wants to move us forward forward but we won't do that if we're too comfortable I mean nobody here but you might know someone like that who won't move forward if they're too comfortable what happens when we're comfortable we stagnate right we stop growing we, we that's what happens when we get too uncomfortable attack Jericho why everything's fine here this is great I'm fine right here uh, please pass the manna you know I'll have another uh, order of manna please you know, we, we become spiritual hobbits, right? Comfort. That's all we focus on, comfort. So God has to change things up on us. God has to stop the manna in our life. He has to do that in order to move us forward. Look at, look at Elijah, another great example. Elijah. Elijah is just confronted the king, and now he's at the brook of Kareth, and who's bringing him food? 
The ravens. The ravens are delivering food every day. I'll have, uh, I'll have, uh, you know, he orders whatever they're bringing that day. I'll have a uh, pizza with anchovies, whatever. They're, they're bringing him food, right? And, and not only that, he has this nice brook flowing. Everybody else is starving to death, dying of thirst. And he's got this brook fl flowing, this nice spring, and he's got food brought by. All he needed was a satellite dish, and everything would have been perfect for, for Elijah, right? He's all set. But God dries up the brook, right? He dries up the brook. And now it's time to move. And he sends them, him to the widow of Zarephath, where it was not comfortable. She had no food. She was starving to death. She had a son who she had to feed, and he was starving to death. It was also a very dangerous area for him to go. It was outside of Israel. It was Jezebel's home territory, the evil queen's home territory. And it was the center of Baal worship. Did you realize that? That's where God sent Elijah. From his comfortable little brook to the center of Baal worship. And they were looking to find him and kill him, right? But God had a purpose. He wanted him to feed the widow and to save her son. Resurrect her son. And he also wanted to prepare him for Mount Carmel, where he called down fire from heaven and defeated Baal. So he sends him to a very uncomfortable place where he's surrounded by Baal worship. That's what God did. How is God taking us out of our comfort zone? How has he taken us out of our comfort zone? How has he stopped the manna in our life? Maybe you had plans. Maybe a career. Maybe college. Maybe marriage. Maybe the perfect marriage. Maybe goals. Maybe financial security. And then all of a sudden it all dried up. It disappeared, in fact. Maybe your very, maybe our very comfortable life has become very uncomfortable. Can anybody relate to that? What has been our, our reaction to that uncomfortableness, to the manna stopping in some way in our life? Has it been panic? Has it been anger? Has it been self-medicating? How have we responded? Or, has it, or is it, and I hope we shift gears, is it, God, what is your purpose? What are you trying to accomplish in my life with this discomfort, with the manna stopping? Do we realize that God has something greater in store, something far greater in mind for our lives? His goal, and this is going to shock some of us, his goal for our life is not our comfort. <laughs> Let's all say it together. God's goal for my life is not my comfort. <laughs> Far from it. God's goal for our life is spiritual maturity. And how do we become spiritual mature? Pressure, stress, using our spiritual muscles. If you if you want to if you have a if you're a coach and you want to have your athletes reach a certain potential, do you tell them to go sit inside and watch TV and eat potato chips? No, get out there and run. And once they run one lap, okay, next day it's two. It's next day it's three. And and God. God's goal is our spiritual maturity. He wants us to achieve our spiritual potential and purpose. And that's why when I said our title for today is out of our comfort zone, but really the title is when God moves us out of our comfort zone. How has God moved us out of our comfort zone? How has the manna stopped in our life? What, how has he put us in a difficult situation to prepare us for something bigger, to move us forward, 
to move us forward spiritually. I know this church, for a lot of us, moved us out of our comfort zone, didn't it? I remember when we felt God leading, and some of those who were there at the very beginning, God leading us to, to start this church, and, and it was a little scary, and it turned out to be scary for a reason. There was a lot of spiritual warfare, right? We all remember, some of you remember that when you were here, and we remember what we went through, and remember all the police, and all this stuff, and uh, all the things that are going on in our country now. We saw that 16 years ago, didn't we? We saw it already starting. And I remember uh, talking to the drummer up here, and uh, uh, you saw the drummer here out of retirement. And uh, are they, is he still here? Where is he? Yeah, there you are. Okay, there you are. And I remember, remember talking to him and saying, we're at the mother church, and we shared the vision. And I remember Paul coming up to me and saying, you know, I, we, we, I feel like God's leading us. We feel like God's leading us to come and help start this church in New Hope, but, but we don't want to come. <laughs> and what did I say? Well, no, but what did I say first? I, I don't want to go either. <laughs> we had a, we've laughed about that many times. I don't want to go either. Oh, okay, we're in the same boat. And for good reason. It's a spiritual war here. And yet we've seen so much growth, personally seen growth, and, and, and been stretched here. And the fruit that we've seen here, I remember Elizabeth after she was here about two years, I remember Elizabeth saying, Chuck, I have grown more in two years than I have grown in the previous 50 years of being a Christian. Why? Because we were stretched together, right? Right? And I know a lot of Yoshi, different ones shaking their heads. They know what I'm talking about. We were stretched here. And, and God continues to stretch us. And, and it's not comfortable, but God's God takes us out of that comfort zone. Maybe you're here today and you're not a Christian yet. Maybe you're here and you're not a Christian, but you're here because God is stretching you. Maybe he has rocked your world in some way. Why? To bring you to your knees. To bring you to the cross. To bring you to him. All of us could say, I know how I became a Christian. God did something in my life to bring me out of my comfort zone. He got my attention. That's his grace. That's his mercy and grace to bring us to him, to bring us to the cross, to bring us to faith in Christ. John three sixteen. for God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. Let's pray. As we go to this time of prayer, I want to say, first of all, maybe you're here and you're not a Christian yet. But you're seeking. And God is pulling you. And maybe God has put you through the ringer. He's put you through some really uncomfortable things to bring you to your knees, like he's done with every one of us, to bring us to our knees and to bring us to the cross, to bring us to Jesus Christ, our Joshua, to put our faith in him. And maybe today is that day that you take the step of faith to follow Joshua through the River Jordan, to follow Jesus through judgment, through the cross, to a relationship with God our Father. Jesus died on the cross. He's our Passover lamb. He died on the cross to pay for every sin we've ever committed, for every wrong thing we've ever done, for every rebellion we've ever committed, for all the shame that we carry. He died for us. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. Are you ready to believe in Jesus? To put your faith in Jesus? To give your life to him? You can do that right now. Just say, God, I repent of my sin. I turn away from it and ask you to forgive me.
I give you the guilt. I give you the shame. I give you the strongholds of my life. I give you the addictions, the sinful addictions. I ask you to forgive me and make me a new person in Jesus Christ. Because I'm putting my faith in him. I trust in Jesus. I'm giving my life to him. If you have prayed that prayer of faith, if you have taken that step of faith, you have just passed from a desert, a spiritual desert, through judgment into the promised land. You have a whole new life ahead of you. It's a life of blessing. It's a life of purpose. It's a life of peace and joy. But it's also a life of claiming your promises in Jesus Christ. And it will be a spiritual battle. But you'll have the presence of Jesus every step of the way. If you've given your life to Jesus, I want to encourage you to make sure you let somebody know. You can fill out the card in the bulletin, stick it in the box on the way out. You can... Tell me on the way out, or if you have a friend here, or a family member, let somebody know. Text, call, let, let somebody know. Let me know. Somebody know. Because we're going to be excited, and we're going to encourage you in your new life in Christ. For those of us who have already put our faith in Christ, how is the Holy Spirit speaking to us? Maybe God has stopped the manna in our life in some way. Our comfortable life has become very uncomfortable in some way. Maybe we haven't handled that too well. We've been clinging to... <laughs> something God doesn't want us to cling to. Maybe we've gotten mad at God over it. Maybe we've become bitter in some way. Maybe we're out looking for that manna somehow, trying, digging around, trying to find it, even though God, has the one, God is the one who has stopped it, dried it up. Will our prayer be today, God, what are you trying to say to me? You've shut this door. Why? What, what are you trying to say to me? Where are you trying to take me? What are you trying to do in my life, God? Maybe you know already what he's trying to do. God, and it's just, God, I surrender to that. I submit to what you're trying to do. Father, my, my, my goal now is not to get back to my comfortable place, but to move into a, a whole new place spiritually, a whole new deeper relationship with you, a whole new way of reaching more people, impacting more people for Christ. Father, we thank you for saving us through your son, Jesus. In, in sanctifying us. Lord, I pray that as we struggle with the place you're trying to take us to, we pray for your mercy and grace that we would surrender to you. And instead of focusing on 
what you took, focus on where you're taking us. Not what you've taken away, but where you're taking us, Lord. Let that be our focus. In Jesus' name.